Good morning, church. So glad you're here to worship with this morning. I want to invite you, if you would, stand with me, and uh, we'll begin our time of worship here in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to highlight two things that are very important to us here at Riverside. The first is this. Um, for a lot of people, it's been a long week. Maybe coming in after going through a valley all week or a mountaintop, whatever your experience. Um, prayer is plan A. And we would love the opportunity to pray with you this morning. If you have something weighing heavy on your heart or you just want to uh, pray a prayer of praise and thanksgiving, the sides of the stage are open. We have our prayer team available and they would love to pray with you at any point during the service. However you feel God leading, if you'd like to respond in that way, feel free. We want to be there for you and to pray with you through the good and the bad. And the second thing is this, today is a baptism service. It is a great day, we're so excited for that. Yeah, that's a good thing to celebrate. We can cheer for that, amen. But I wanna tell you, if, if you are considering baptism, today can be that day. Uh, if you didn't dress for it, hey, we've got clothes for you, that's okay. If you didn't bring a towel, guess what? We got you covered. Um, at any point during the worship this morning, if you feel the Holy Spirit leading in your life that, man, I just need to follow Jesus in this way to be baptized, I'd invite you right through these doors, my right, your left side, there'll be somebody out there ready and willing to talk with you about baptism and taking the next steps in your faith. Church, would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your care for each of us. Lord, I pray that as we worship you this morning, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, I pray that we would just feel your power and your love. God, we so desperately need you. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
this morning.
Hey everyone, hello, I'm Jeff, I'm the student pastor here, and I have the great privilege this morning to baptize a whole bunch of people, and um, this right here, I would like to introduce to you, is Jalisa, so hello, say hello to Jalisa here. <laughs> um, for those of you that serve in student ministry, you know who Jalisa is, uh, any 8th grade girls out there, 8th grade student girls, I think they may have been the first service, but... Um, Anyways, uh, Jalisa serves with our uh, student ministry. She works with our eighth grade girls. She's their small group leader. And this morning, she wants to make that profession of faith to all of you that she has followed. She decided to follow Jesus. Now, just like everyone that's entering into this baptismal up here, uh, Jesus has already rescued them. He's already saved them. He's already done the work. And now she wants to tell all of you about it. So, Jalisa... Um, excited that I get to baptize you this morning. And this also, behind her, I forgot to, don't forget, don't forget Dad. Uh, this is Oscar. So Oscar's going to be uh, helping me with baptizing Jalisa. It's just a cool thing to, um, where we get to be a part and also get the family to be a part of her baptism st uh, statement of faith here. So Jalisa, um, I would like to ask you two questions, okay? Yes. Have you um, asked Jesus to be Lord of your life? I have. And are you ready to serve him for the rest of your days on this earth? I am. Well, Jalisa, I'll turn you over here. Jalisa, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is Stephanie. I just got to meet Stephanie just a few moments ago. And Stephanie, I'm going to ask you the same two questions. Uh, Stephanie, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus alone to be Lord and Savior of your life? I have. And Stephanie, are you ready to serve him the rest of your days here on this earth? Yes, I am. Stephanie, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is Jocelyn. Everyone say hello, Jocelyn. <laughs> just met Jocelyn just a few moments ago, and uh, I'm excited to be able to baptize her. Jocelyn, I'm going to ask you the same questions. Uh, Jocelyn, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus alone to be the Savior of your life? Yes. And Jocelyn, are you ready to serve him the rest of your days while here on this earth? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Jocelyn, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone, this is Lincoln. Lincoln is a ninth grader here. And uh, Lincoln, I'm going to ask you the same questions, okay? You ready? Yeah. All right. Lincoln, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus alone to be the Savior of your life? Yes, I have. And Lincoln, are you ready to serve him for the rest of your days while you're here on this earth? Yes. All right, Lincoln. Based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can't 
turn back Cause he's not done with me yet He's not done with me yet And there's so much more to the story not done with us yet. You're not done with me yet. You're not done with our church yet. You're not done with Fort Myers yet, Lord. You have so much more to our story. And I'm so thankful that you're the one that's writing it. You say that whatever you've started, you're gonna fulfill it to completion and it's gonna be good. And so I'm holding on to that hope today, Lord, that there's nothing I can do that's gonna mess up your plan. Thank you for that truth this morning. Thank you for the reminder of your faithfulness through baptisms. And thank you that we get to walk out of this room today free to do what you have called us to do. And it's in your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, happy fall. Even though it's hot outside, I'm channeling the fall vibes, wishing for cooler weather. Um, I know that I'm gonna sweat to death, but I don't want logic to ruin my joy. So I'm wearing a sweater and I'm wearing boots and I'm gonna own the decision I made this morning. <laughs> my name is Peggy Orlando and I'm the communications director here and it is a privilege and an honor to be able to say welcome home to you this morning. If this is your first time joining us, if you'll do me a favor and scan the QR code on the seat in front of you or visit riversidechurch.org 411. There's a little spot for you to click connect. And from there, you can tell us who you are um, and we can help you get connected to take your next step with us. And if you're with us here in person, after this service, if you go through the double doors, um, on the left-hand side, our team, Riley and his um, team would be happy to meet you, put a name with a face, um, and answer any questions that you might have. And if you're joining us online, if you write in the comments, I'm new, or just fill out the connect card, someone from our team will reach out to you and help you get connected. If you've been around for a little while, um, but you haven't done our Discover sessions yet, I highly recommend you start the next one on October 1st. It's three weeks in a row, three separate sessions that build on each other where you will learn your purpose, your mission, and your influence and how you can partner with us to make and send disciples who love and live like Jesus here in Fort Myers and all over the world. So if you haven't done it yet, it's an interactive course where you'll get to meet people um, who are along the same journey as you um, and then find out how you can use your spiritual giftings to join us as we make and send disciples. You also may have heard of this thing called Pathway. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, I discover Pathway Base Camp, there's so many things. Pathway is our strategic initiative to equip you to be an intentional disciple. And so it's brand new. We are starting it on October 4th and there are only 18 seats left. So, if you haven't registered yet, claim one of those 18 seats. It's three weeks in a row. We're providing dinner, childcare, um, and it's gonna be good. I'm very excited for what the Lord is doing through Pathway um, and what's to come. So claim one of those seats. 
I have a lot of things. Also next week is our Edgewood co food collection. So if you have not um, picked up a little shopping list, you can do that on the way out. You can also visit the 411 page to click the little Amazon link and they'll send the stuff directly to our office. So you don't even have to go to the grocery store to pick those up. Um, but together we are able to feed more than 100 kids on the weekends when they don't get a hot meal except for at school. So please do some shopping this week. Um, bring that stuff back next week for us to be able to pack our bags. The last thing I have for you this morning, um, you may have noticed under your seat there are these little, mine's upside down, there are these little Riverside Church information update cards. So because we believe that the Lord is doing good things, we are very excited for the season that we're about to enter, but we want to make sure we have the correct information for you. So if you will do me a favor and either Fill this out right now. There's, it's under your seat with a pen or all of you technically savvy people, there's a QR code. You can scan that from your seat right now and fill out the form online. Um, if you do a paper one, just drop it off at next steps on your way out the door. Just so you know, we are not going to randomly show up at your house knocking on your door or spam you with email or text messages. This is just a way for us to communicate what's happening here at Riverside and in the event of another hurricane, we are on the one year anniversary of Hurricane Ian, what our team did with your information is we made phone calls to every single person in our database. There was a team um, of ladies that just came in every day and worked through that list. And that was the way that we were able to find out what needs you had. And we were able to send teams out to you that much faster. So this updated information is super important for us to have because we want to be able to care for you well. We believe as a staff that that's our job. Um, that's what we were, we're here for, is to care for you well. And so this is the, the, really the only way that we can do that is if we have the updated information. Thank you. That is all I have for you this morning. I'm done talking. I've used all my words for the day. But Steve is here with a word from 1 Corinthians. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Buenos Dias. Nobody? All right. Next week, I've got a treat for you Spanish speakers. Um, I'll just let it happen next week. It'll be in English, but I've got a friend who actually speaks Spanish, unlike me, who just does it badly. Peggy mentioned Pathway, uh, Discover, Basecamp. Those are all important things. You can do any of them. They don't have to be in order. But Pathway is really a chance for us to equip our leaders and to pour into us as we walk this thing out. We're excited about it. Base camp's kind of a starting place, how we do discipleship and those things. So anyway, I'm going to quit because they always tell me, wow, you confused everybody and made it worse. I need to rewind all my slides. So don't look at the screen. Don't look. If somebody up there wants to rewind them real quick. Okay, she gave me a thumb. So you won't see all the, oh, wow. Okay, that worked all the way. Thanks. Let me pray for us and we will jump into the word. God, I am grateful uh, for the church. We're grateful for our salvation, for you, our king, but Lord, we're also grateful that you bring us into community, uh, that you give us each other to walk this thing out. And God, I just pray for um, humility among all of us as we walk into your word this morning that, uh, Lord, you just show us clearly what it is we stand on and, and you speak to us through it. Because, Lord, there's so many voices around us and we need to hear from you. So, God, we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Ha ha, it's working. Um, oh, I have a prayer request. I forgot to do this. Um, our staff is going on a retreat this week. Last year, we did this and there was a hurricane and that was really bad. 
Uh, this year, we're only going about an hour away, so this will be good. But know that we'll have several of us today, and then the rest of the staff will join us Tuesdays. The office will kind of be shut down, but we have email. We would love for you to pray for us for wisdom and unity and clarity. There's some good work we've got to do to get ready for the year ahead. So please be praying for us. Okay. Now, a few years ago, there was this radical movement in Christianity. It started out with great fervor. It was marked by this return to Jesus as the high priest and the Bible as the authority. And you were saved by grace through faith. The followers of this movement made great sacrifices. There were arrests, there were death threats, lots of controversy and lots of bad press. And the new group wanted to name themselves after the leader. And maybe you've passed by one of their buildings because they did this. They named themselves after the guy who kind of gets credited with it. If you drive by the building, it will say so-and-so Lutheran Church. Have you ever seen one of these? Heard of this guy, Martin Luther? Some? Okay, he's an important one to look up. Uh, Luther heard about this in 1522. So this is a few years ago. And he heard that the first Protestant Christians, which would be us, those who protested what was happening in Roman Catholicism, began to break away from that. The first ones in England and France and Germany were being called Lutherans. And he wrote, the first thing I ask is that people should not make use of my name and should not call themselves Lutherans, but Christians. This bothered him. That he's like, we do this for Jesus, and you're sticking my name on it. He continues, what's Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor bag of maggots, oh, sorry, poor stinking bag of maggots that I am, come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name? He clarified some things. Hey, <laughs> this is about Jesus, not about Luther, but we get so quickly distracted. In AD 33, right about then, Jesus said this prayer for us. He said, I do not ask for these only, his followers, but also for those who will believe in me through their words, so us in the future, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me one that his followers would be united so that the world may believe that was about 33 AD by AD 55 or 56 how many years is that all right the accountants are in the first service you all need to know that it's been 22 23 years uh 22 or 23 years, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, I appeal to you brothers by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. It took them less than 22 years to go from Jesus' prayer for unity to factions so significant that Paul has to address it as the first issue in his letter. We're not good at unity. And, and these weren't denominations. These weren't big theological camps where, oh, there's a huge difference in doctrine. These were Paul, Apollos, Cephas, or Cephas, is it Peter is the other name we use for him, and Christ. Those are the camps that they were dividing into. Those four people all taught the same thing. They taught the same gospel. Peter was taught it by Jesus. Paul was taught by Jesus and by Barnabas. And Apollos was taught by Priscilla and Aquila, who was taught by Paul. They were all teaching the same thing. But that church had given weight to the particular teacher, like people saying, well, I got baptized at Riverside. Oh, well, I got baptized 
by Peter Darlene, or I got baptized in the Jordan River. Like, that's messed up. That's not the important part. And Paul's going to tell them so, and he's going to tell them what to do about it because there's a piece of truth that he's going to bring it all to that helps, that it's so easy for us to drift from, but it's so key to who we are. So how do we be one like Jesus prayed? If you got a Bible, open it to 1 Corinthians. So make your way over there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then you'll hit it. If you're scrolling, just work your way down. You can download them. There's free ones in the lobby. Second half of the Bible that explicitly explains the life and death of Jesus Christ and his fulfillment of what was promised in the first half. Unity is difficult. Paul's going to clarify some things, and he starts with this reminder. I appeal to you, brothers, sisters, This is going to show up several times in the book of 1 Corinthians. We saw it last week, this reminder that he's talking to Christians. He's not talking to lost people. He's talking to believers. He's speaking to family, people who love Jesus, but in this area are immature. Do you know you can do that? You can love Jesus, be a follower of Jesus, and still make a bad decision, right? Do you know this? Christians can be immature, or you can act in an immature way. You can act immaturely. So look at his appeal to brothers. I appeal to you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He's not addressing some area of legitimate disagreement, like they're divided because they're arguing over whether Jesus really is the Messiah or the Son of God or some big thing. He's not even addressing areas where uh, they're trying to figure out life, like do we shop at Roman stores? Can we vote in Roman elections? How do we do this? Is the things where it would be okay to wrestle through and maybe not all agree. The disagreements they were having were foolish, and dangerous, the kind of division that can make them ineffective as a church. I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. Knowing what we know, and you may not know much about those four, that's okay, but knowing what we know, what do you think the differences were? What were they picking? Because we're not sure. These four people all preach the same gospel, especially Jesus. How do they divide up into camps? Let's go, what were the differences? Maybe because Paul started with Gentiles and he would begin that way over time or Peter starts with Jewish people or Apollos would start with logic. That was part of the way he taught. Jesus starts with all of it. I I don't even know what divisions they would have found. It's silly. None of those are teaching false doctrines. None of those were corrupt. None of those are funneling money to their mistresses. It's like, oh, I follow this one because you know that Paul. These are all people preaching the gospel. So it was just hero worship. And it was ridiculous. Was it okay to learn from Apollos? Yeah. Should they learn from Peter? Learn from Paul? Yes, they should be learning from all three. All three of those are leaders in the church established by Christ. They all had different strengths and there were areas that they would relate to a different set of people. They should learn from all. This was immature like a fan fight in grade school. Do you ever see this happen when I was little? Kids would get into arguments over football players. This will date me. But someone would say, Terry Bradshaw couldn't escape a vacuum cleaner. Or, and, and that would be followed up with, my grandmother could tackle Roger Staubach. And then an actual fight would happen on the playground over that. You can update that with current and maybe even polarizing world-class athletes like Tom Brady or LeBron James or Aaron Rodriguez or Messi or Ronaldo. But as an adult... Somewhere in there, there should be a point of honesty where you're able to say, I recognize that these are all exceptional athletes, even the ones I don't like. And not get in a schoolyard fight that divides a church. 
So Paul asks three very specific questions to clarify the issue. First, he says, is Christ divided? Is he? Like, is there more than one Jesus? You can answer this out loud if you want to. Okay. No! Is there some other gospel? No! And, and then he says, was Paul crucified for you? No! Who is it who died for us? Christ, Jesus. Who exactly do we worship? Jesus. And then he says, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No! You're baptized in the name of Christ. Where is your allegiance? Is it Jesus or have you shifted it to some teacher, a servant of Jesus? It's like those people in Acts that would start to worship the angels and the angels are like, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. We worship Jesus. So be careful. Sometimes theologians and thinkers help us wrestle with really hard questions and they may communicate to you in a way it's like, I understand this person so well when they teach. People like Luther or Calvin, there's so many of these, but those people are not Jesus. They're servants and they're pointing at him. Only Jesus is Messiah, King. He wears the crown. We follow Jesus. Others may help us do that and the ones who are sincere, they'll all point to him and we learn from them and use that. You, you run into this sometimes. You, you hear somebody teach and you think, oh, I've got a friend and they speak that language. This would be helpful. He's talking science or he's talking Spanish or whatever. This is a teacher I could connect them to, but they point to Jesus. We follow him. Jesus is going to use Paul and Peter to write scripture, scripture that points to Jesus, that helps us understand. In the next few verses, Paul will say that he's glad he didn't baptize any of these people. I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. And he remembers, well, I did baptize this one, but I'm glad I didn't do it because they were stuck on who did the baptizing. Like the baptizer has any power. Peter almost dropped a guy first service, if you were here. <laughs> or the baptisms. A baptizer's nothing. It's an incredible honor, but it's just an honor because we get to do that in his name. We're just a person. It's the name that we're baptized into. That's everything. It's Jesus. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Baptism is important, but it's not the point. It's a response to the gospel. The gospel is the point. Gospel, it comes from a word that means good news the good news of the coming of the Messiah, the anointed one, to fulfill the word of God and accomplish salvation through his life and death and resurrection for all who believe by grace through faith. That is what Paul is about. The gospel was worth the risk. The gospel was worth giving his life to, worth dying for. The gospel is the point. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Eloquence can be a great thing. We like it when people use colorful language, when they're skilled with words. And you watch this in your neighborhoods where some guy outside your door clarifies a crisis in your mind and appeases your aversion and draws you toward a decision to maybe buy those solar panels. Eloquence can be a good thing. It can be kind of risky. And sometimes clever words talk you into things that you regret. Paul ain't got time for that. The gospel is not a clever sales call. Nothing against you guys that do sales. But that's what, no, it's not what the gospel is. You don't get there by a clever pitch. The marketing pitch of the crucifixion of Jesus is not eloquent. If you come to Christ through eloquent words, you may have misunderstood the core of the whole message because the gospel is an offense. It's not eloquent. The power is not in clever words. For the word of the cross is folly, foolishness, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I attended synagogue a couple of weeks ago with one of my daughters. I was so excited about this, got to learn so much. I'm eager to go back. But in one of the prayers that evening, there was this appeal to God to establish his kingship and redemption and hasten the coming of his Mashiach, Messiah. They, they were praying actively for the Messiah to come. 
we as Christians believe that he has. That's Jesus. They still pray for it, partly because what Jesus did was unthinkable. The idea was so offensive. The Messiah, the one they had awaited, was brutally tortured and executed and humiliated on a pagan Roman device. In the Old Testament, the scripture was clear. Anybody hanged on a tree on a wooden thing was cursed. It was so clear that Paul explains it for us in the New Testament, in the book called Galatians. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. We preach Christ the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of God, he himself God was arrested by godless men and made to bleed and die. That's not eloquent. That's an offense. God died? The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. It's it's nonsense. It's obscene. The Western novelist Cameron Judd, anybody read any of his books? He published his research notes one time on the county uh, in East Tennessee where I was born. It seems we were known for turmoil, which if you know any hillbillies, you're like, I understand where this came from. Um, East Tennessee was a southern state during the Civil War, but the region in the east was full of Union sympathizers who rebelled against the Confederate South. And so in the book, he called it the Bridge Burners, He recounts the Union plot to burn all the railroad bridges between Virginia and Georgia, all these railroads that went through Tennessee to cut off southern supply lines. Uh, They only successfully burned four bridges, and many of the bridge burners were captured. And when they were captured, they were hanged. And then they were left hanging alongside the railroad tracks outside Greenville, Tennessee, where I was born. Can you imagine that? You're on the train, you got your kids. Oh, we're going to, oh, (laughs) there's bodies dangling to humiliate them. So everybody could see what they would do to those kinds of people. Public execution was designed for fear and shame and humiliation. It's been used that way for centuries where those in power take the other group, whoever it is, and say, we'll use this to humiliate you. The gospel we preach says that our king and savior was publicly executed and humiliated. What what kind of God can be killed? It was an offense. That's a difficult thing to embrace. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It makes perfect sense. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. God will tear apart the logic of humans. He's going to do something that people couldn't see coming. He took the unthinkable that he himself could become the necessary sacrifice for sin like one perfect holy lamb and make that the message. And you don't get to that message through clever or eloquent arguments. They may help, they may help you ask the questions, but you get there ultimately by realizing that your efforts to please God, your effort to rise to a higher knowledge, to align yourself with the best preacher or the best thinker, to figure out life, your efforts are malarkey. I couldn't put a stronger word. Um, there's one I want to use that starts with a B. Don't shout it out. You can use that in your notes. It's nonsense. It's rubbish. The Apostle Paul almost used that word one time. He was referring to his own efforts, all the work he had done to be a religious scholar before he met Jesus, all that he had done to try to live right, to please God, all the things he did to earn God's approval, he said, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. This word rubbish in the original in Greek, it, it's um, skabala. It means refuge or garbage or excrement. 
all the things I did, all my own effort to fix me, to please God, it was bogus. Excrement. It's crapola. His work was rubbish. His hope was to be found in him, in Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. He couldn't do it. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, he needed God to give him his. His own work was rubbish. I need what God and only God can do. The offense of the cross is that your best effort is rubbish. You can not save yourself. You cannot earn it. You can't repay it. You can't deserve it. Your only hope is in the Messiah who came and was sacrificed on a Roman torture device to make payment for sin through his blood. That turns the world on its head. That confounds logic and reason. It's like, wait, God would do what? He did what? And it seems foolish, but for those of us who are being saved, we now understand. The cross pulls down pride. It takes that out of the equation. We bring nothing to God except utter humility. Please, Lord God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's no room for pride at the cross. So how do you get division in the church about which teacher is the best how can there be division on secondary issues like politics or viruses or race or color or music primary issues we have to draw lines Jesus is the only way we can't build a church and deviate from that it's like that's not a church anymore there's one God he's three in one the Bible's the word there's primary issues but the secondary issues that's what was crippling the church in Corinth they were divided over pride And it shows up in really subtle ways, at least it does in my life. I noticed a number of years ago, I'd started saying Christ instead of Jesus because it felt more intellectual. Watch for this. Churches that really pride themselves on intellect, sometimes they'll start talking about the creator, they'll use colorful metaphors, they'll refer to Christ, the redeemer, these things, and, and we don't always reduce it to the simplicity of the cross and the brutality that happened to Jesus. We, we pull back, it's like this is the true thing. You, all those words are good, but when you start only using certain ones, it's like, what are you doing? Or, you can, you can watch um, this happen. I talk about the things I used to struggle with, not the things I actually struggle with. This is really popular. You notice this on stage? Most Christians uh, who share about alcohol or porn or gossip describe how they used to struggle with that. Like they're no longer tempted by naked people, whatever it was. Very few share the, hey, this is my journey. Here's what I'm doing now because these are still real struggles, but I've, I've built some safeguards, but I'm still susceptible or I still struggle with this. We, we tend to treat it like we used to. And now I'm above all that. I'm not tempted by sin like you people. I'm still tempted. But it's so easy for us to start to place ourselves just a little higher on the hill of holiness than other people, which is among the most immature thing a Christian can do. We tend to think of immaturity as all the other stuff. Oh, you reacted emotionally. Oh, you got upset. You, pride is at the core of the most immature. And the cross tears that ground out from under your feet. It reminds us like the words of Luther, I was but a sack of maggots. Jesus has done all the saving. His work is all the work that mattered. My work was rubbish. My only hope is that he offers his righteousness to me through his death. That was our only hope. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. You see that human wisdom lets us down. In just arguing, they couldn't work their way to salvation. God had to do something that turns it on its head. He comes in in utter humility. 
for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. People want proof. And you think about this through the Old Testament. The Jews wanted signs and wonders like what happened in the Old Testament. The Gentiles, these people in Corinth, they wanted reason and logic. They're very affected by the philosophers at the time. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. You trip over it. It's an offense. The death of Messiah is a stumbling block to Jews who await him. It's like, well, that couldn't be the Messiah. He died. It's a stumbling block. And it's foolishness to others. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. To those who God draws, those he allows, the crucifixion of Jesus is everything. And it turns the world upside down. It puts it on its head. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He is unthinkable. He did something unimaginable. His plan was greater than anything we could imagine. He would save us himself. There's no room for pride. The cross is humiliation. It requires you to bow and ask forgiveness. To recognize your failure, your shortcomings, your inability to fix yourself, to make yourself good enough. It requires a humbling. And just in case you've forgotten, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Not many of that congregation were impressive. Do you know impressive people? If you do, you, you find there's plenty of shortcomings there too. They may excel in an area, but it comes with this other stuff. But God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He is like he used a device made for humiliation and torture to overcome sin and death. We didn't see that coming. He shamed. Shame's kind of out of vogue today. We're so careful that sometimes we're not even honest about lifestyles and behaviors that will indeed kill you. We're like body positive, sex positive, drug positive. It's like, that's dangerous. We don't want to shame anybody except bullies. We're okay shaming bullies, people who shame other people. Well, God shames the shamers, those who saw themselves on top, superior, the ones who had arrived, who saw themselves as greater. He embarrasses, confounds humbles that you will have to ask for forgiveness because you can't accomplish it on your own he uses the desperate who cling to jesus to reveal that we were all desperate and part of his grace is letting you understand that you desperately need what he offers god chose what is low and despised in the world even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. This is weird language, uh, things that are and things that are not. He's expanding to some of the Greek philosophers, some of what was being taught at that time, the wise. Uh, people like Plato. Plato believed that the greater a thing was, the greater its existence, the more it existed. This is super simple, and I don't understand. I take, I gotta go read. Um, and the lesser a thing was, the less it existed. So a human exists, it's a great thing. It's all these parts of nature that have come together to make this thing. It has great existence, it are, it is. But mud, mud doesn't exist much. It are not, it is not, it just barely exists. So when he says that he took the things that are not to shame the things that are, it's saying he flipped it upside down. God chose mud, low people, to reduce, to humble those who thought they were great, who exist much, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This is key. You're not clever enough. You were not cool enough. No one gets to God by self-effort. You will bring nothing to him except that in your humiliation, you accepted the hand of Jesus as he offered it. The, the cross extinguishes ego. It eliminates boasting. You cannot say, I am better than you and I need Jesus at the same time. Only one of those is true. 
And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You're in Christ because God let you in Christ. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. If you want something to boast about, it's not Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Cephas. It's not where you're baptized. It's not how awesome your church is or how many degrees you have or how little you sin. It's not even how much better you know the Bible. No, we boast about our Savior who saved even us. Paul, the apostle of Jesus, the writer of Scripture, he had credentials beyond comparison. He says to this church full of pride, and when I came to you, brothers... I and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He decided ahead of time I would simply preach Jesus and him crucified. In other words, the cross. I'll just preach the cross. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. That's the opposite of what we tend to elevate in speakers, isn't it? We like competent orators, bold speakers with confidence and eloquence. This is where we're going. This is, what, this is how you fix that. That's the opposite of what Paul just said he did at this church. He came in with weakness and fear and trembling. And scholars are not completely sure what he means by this. Uh, some speculate that maybe he was ill. There was maybe a sickness with him while he was there. Some wonder, was he intimidated by this Roman city that he didn't want to stay at, but Jesus had told him to stay there? Was he concerned about more persecution? I would be if I were Paul and had gone through some of what he had already gone through. I would not be excited about being beaten to death again. But it fits. His message was the cross, period. Not how impressive Paul was. It's just the cross. That's it. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom. It's not just wise things that were clear and understandable, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I don't know what miracles happened then. I wish I could have seen it. But for most of us, um, we're much more deeply affected by what we've seen God do than just the arguments that help sustain our faith or the the words around it. We, We saw him do something. Primarily, he took this and saved it and changed some of what my heart longs for. I still struggle with those things, but it's like, oh, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do this now. He did something in our lives. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The cross is enough. It's sufficient. We don't have to be clever We don't have to be the greatest strategists or planners. We don't have to have a perfect argument laid out when we talk to our friend about Jesus. We don't don't have to know the answers to all the questions. We just have to cling to the cross and preach Christ and him crucified. God will do the rest. So how do we be one like Jesus prayed for us? Well, we, we preach the cross. Sometimes we preach it to each other because we forget. Sometimes we preach it to ourselves because I forget. In my life, it's really, in maybe yours, it's really easy to start feeling like everything's on your shoulders. All oh, the faith of your children or the success of your spouse or you see deception in a classroom and think, oh, this is so dangerous or you're in a board meeting and think, oh, this is so wrong or I can't carry the weight of the world. That's his job. But I can cling to the cross and I can preach its offensive simplicity. God fulfilled his plan by sending his son to pay for sin through death, on a cross. And he extends that payment to all who humble themselves and believe and accept it. And when I preach that to myself, it reminds me of who my family is. It's all the others who call on the name of Jesus. All the other people where I can overlook some secondary things because they follow the same Lord I do. He saved them too. And that extinguishes pride that creeps into my life. And I think it will do that for you also. Can I pray for us? Father, um, 
I'm grateful for the simplicity of the answer that Paul gives. We're so quick to find arguments to how to do unity better, how to do these things, and you just reduce it to the cross. This thing that, that takes pride away from us. There's no room for pride when we cry out for you as our Savior. And I, I, I'm grateful for that reminder. And God, that's worth giving our lives to. We thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen. Remember, as we close, there's a prayer team who'd love to pray with you today. If you're just carrying something, you need some help talking to him about that. And then may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.